Ah, yes, the old script, North Texas. Well, welcome back to At Home with Hank, episode five, brought to you by Virus. Now, the last time we did this, I got to be honest, I had to leave the uh, friendly confines of my backyard shack and go back into Apogee because I was having Wi-Fi problems. But when you deal with high rollers like Greg Johnson at Virus, you have to get things right. So I've got much better Wi-Fi today, and I'm back on the back porch. And again, I'm kicking it old school because we're going to take another look at a classic moment, actually a classic season in the history of Mean Green football. We're going to go back to 2003. This was a nine-win team. This was a great defense. This was one of the more historic offenses. This was a team that really had it all. And the focal point all year was the run game. And when you lead the nation in rushing, let me show you what happens. You get, get to have a koozie made with your number on it. I think there's probably some point bank people still out there that may have one of those. Uh, but it also means you're the principal running back for a team that would rip off not one, not two, not three, but four straight trips to a bowl, perennial Sunbelt champions. And so you can guess right now, I'm going to bring in the guy that made the uh, cover of the media guide, number 43. Patrick Cobbs. Mr. Cobbs, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How's it, uh, how's it going? I'm excited to be on this uh, old Hank's backyard thing. It's awesome. Well, uh, when you take a look at your career, obviously you're a running backs coach again uh, at North Texas, uh, waiting it out, seeing what's going to happen with the upcoming season. Prior to that, you were at Billy Ryan High School, which I was grateful for because my kids were there during that time. Uh, great career in the National Football League, mostly with the Dolphins. But a UNT Hall of Famer, and 2003 was your signature year because you led the nation in rushing. And when you look back at the, the middle of that Daryl Dickey era where things were going well, the run game was just really what we were known for. Um, just talk a little bit about your relationship with Coach Dickey and, and how you ended up coming to North Texas as really a, a guy that, that we lucked out in getting. Oh, man. Such, such a long story. Uh, I'll give you a short version. Uh, playing for Coach Dickey, first and foremost, was amazing. Uh, the guy was was awesome to play for. Uh, he was great with his players. Um, he had a he had a persona about him that just made you want to because he didn't lie to you. He's going to tell you straight to your face. He didn't sugarcoat anything. Uh, he was consistent every day, and uh, it made it enjoyable. I mean, if you wasn't worth the crap, he was going to tell you that, and if you were, he was and so that, that was the fun part about it. Um, leading up to my decision to come to North Texas, I mean, I really didn't have a lot of options. Um, but uh, so one number afternoon in basketball practice, old Spencer left, which comes walking into the basketball gym and talks me into coming on a visit, uh, came down here on a visit. They offered me a scholarship while I was on the visit, committed right on the spot, uh, was super pumped about it. And uh, about a week before signing day, um, Oklahoma State come in and offered me a scholarship too, but you know my commitment meant something. I stuck with it. Came to North Texas and uh, super, ha super, super happy about my decision. Well, it turned out to be a, a wonderful arrangement for both ends. And and 2003 again is is where you began to really put everything together. And there was a lot of hype leading into 2003, coming off a bowl win uh, against Cincinnati. Uh, a win streak in league play and everyone kind of was starting to really pay attention to mean green football again. But one thing didn't change. We played really tough non-conference schedules back then. So as we begin to look at this season, it begins back up in your home state, not against Oklahoma state, but against OU. And at the time, this was the biggest crowd ever at an OU game. They had just expanded the stadium. Was this a homecoming of sorts for you? I know thinking back on it, you were pretty jacked to have an opportunity to run the ball against the Sooners. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, as a true freshman, I did in 01, uh, played against them uh, as a backup. I mean, it was fun coming back, but getting the opportunity to be a starter, uh, playing against OU, playing against those big teams uh, was exciting, man. We, we enjoyed the opportunity. Um, you know, everybody on the outside knew it was a payday, but it was kind of just, you know, at that point in time, we wanted to see where we stacked up. We knew we had a good defense. I mean, a great defense. Uh, we felt like our running game was good. Our offensive line was I mean, it's about as good as you can get. So we wanted to kind of, you know, coming off a bowl win, we wanted to see where we stacked up against, you know, really the best in the country. I think they were top three at the time, or maybe even number one in the country with uh, Jason White and 
So it, it was, uh, we look forward to the opportunity. Yeah, and when you look back, I mean, the one thing that I know you know as a player and a coach is sometimes those games are an opportunity to set the bar higher for the rest of the year. And I think the good North Texas teams I've been around, when they've done something against a Power 5 school, it pays dividends later. And I think I think that game did. Uh, but you mentioned it, and you always give credit to, uh, to defense and special teams. We saw Eric Russell a moment ago. His special teams in this game, uh, make a play that kind of said, hey, watch out for North Texas this year. It doesn't matter who we're playing. We're going to make plays on special teams. Absolutely. Uh, I don't I don't know what the number was. I, I want to say we blocked six or eight uh, punts that year. I mean, we blocked a lot. We were responsible for a lot of uh, disruption in the special teams unit. Our special teams is probably one of the best in the country. Um, and right there when they blocked that punt, you know, I was starting a running back, and I was the one trying to scoop that ball up right there, trying to – trying to see if I couldn't get it into the end zone. But uh, it was fun, man. You know, playing special teams was a was a blast. It was something I looked forward to, especially punt return. You know, I'd, I went and begged to, to be on that unit. So it was uh, it was fun to be on it. Well, that was Jonas Buckles with the uh, the play there. And Buck was one of those guys. When I, I think back, we looked at the 2013 team, you know, a week ago uh, with Zach Orr and Marcus Trice and amazed at the hits that Larry Me Lee was producing. And I, I – I thought I haven't seen anyone hit anyone that hard since Jonas Buckles, but Buckles uh, comes up with a, a big play here. And, you know, that's Jason White. That's one of the best quarterbacks in the history of OU. And it just shows North Texas was ready to make plays that day. Oh, absolutely. We, we came in ready to play. Uh, the ball didn't bounce our way at certain times. And it was a, a fantastic team. I mean, they were loaded with talent up and down the board. Uh, but we went in, we played hard. We felt like they, they didn't just, you know, bully us the way that, you know, they, they would go on to bully a lot of people in, in Big 12. But uh, we had we had our moments. Uh, and you mentioned Jonas Buckles. I mean, that guy, the guy really buckles is a good last name for you because when he hits you, you'd, you'd buckle a little bit. And, and not to mention Craig Jones on the other side and Marquise Knowlton. And, I mean, those those dudes, I mean, they were great, great dudes back in the secondary. It was unbelievable, uh, that defense altogether from the, from the line and the front seven to the back four. It was unbelievable. Yeah, Buckles and Jones, that, that is a tandem that uh, wreaked terror. Well, you lose to Oklahoma, but it's a good showing, and, it, and it's one where there's some things to build on, and it's good because a huge opportunity in game number two. North Texas had been going on the road to play all of these teams from the Big 12 and every other conference, but finally – we're able to get Baylor to come to Fouts Field and say what you want about Fouts. When you did fill it up, it was a great environment and it was full that day. What, what are your memories of, of the Baylor opportunity? Man, that, that day was rocking. And uh, leaving, leaving that OU game, I got hit a couple times in the thigh and it was hurting quite a bit. But coming into that Baylor game, we were excited. You know, we, were, we knew it was going to be a big crowd because they were right down the road. It was a Big 12 opponent. Uh, and when you packed Fouts Field, and half the stadium was 10. So when they got the stomping, it got really loud in there. And uh, we had a blast. We, we went into that game. Uh, you know, I routed off a long run in that game, and it kind of stretched it out. And I, I didn't finish the game. But we had an absolute blast playing in that game. Uh, I think I think five running backs had touchdowns. I know uh, I want to say four or five running backs had a touchdown in that game. It was pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah, Roy Bishop had three. Yep. Uh, I think Mitchell scored in that one as well, and maybe Kevin Moore. But, Kevin uh, Moore. you know, the big thing is you see the defense with Evan Cardwell coming up. It, it, it showed that even if some guys were sidelined momentarily, yourself included, there was a lot of depth on both sides of the ball. And that, that's a real credit, I think, to Coach Dickey and that staff because to create depth at that time at North Texas was not an easy task. No, you definitely had to, you had to recruit your butt off and do your homework on kids and, and you know, we went over two or three years right there where we felt like he didn't miss on a lot of kids. I and mean, we had, a, we had a blast. And the best part about that team is we enjoyed playing with each other. Like, I don't, I don't ever remember a time where guys would, you know, not want to hang out with each other. We, we absolutely enjoyed competing and playing the best for one another. And, and that's really what made us a, that Oh three team, you know, pretty special. It, it was, it was fun all the way through. The defense was never in a fight with the offense and the offense was never in a fight with defense or special teams. I mean, we were all one unit and it was a blast because we all intermixed in that, in, in every phase of the game and, and just had a joy of playing. 
So you mentioned you got nicked up a little bit against the Sooners, but you got it out. And in this uh, in this play right here, you do show that you've got a burst. This is a big play right here, 81 yards. Yeah, that was early in the first half. And uh, after that, you know, after I went off to the sideline, it just tightened up on me and, and I could uh, I could barely bend my thigh. And so I set the, the game out. But it was it was I mean, play. I mean, I was excited about it. Um, you know, uh, it's a good cut. Great back ball. some guys and, and even Johnny Quinn came in motion right there and got a big block and, and you know I, I, it sprung me for a long one. Well it was a day where that defense would take care of business and, and take some pressure off. Baylor turned the ball over six times in the first half and we'll take a look at just a litany of, of different players coming in here but that's a great shot of that crowd. It was a hot day. Yep. There's there's Booger. Talk oh, about yeah. Booger. Oh, uh, Brandon Kenny is one of the best athletes I've ever been around in my life. I mean, the 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 sheer sight. If you walked up to him and you seen him, it, it, you know, short, big, looked like he was overweight, but then you got around him, and the guy is an absolute freak athlete. And uh, and people don't really know that about old Brandon Kennedy. He was he was unbelievable. And uh, Cardwell was awesome. You know, there's Mark Keith Knowlton making interceptions. There's you know um, Cody Spencer, I think, makes interceptions. Taylor Casey, I think, made an interception. We had a couple of fumbles. I mean, it was – and then I think in the second half, we got a, a – or we kicked it deep, and we ended up getting the ball from him as well. So, it was it was a fun game. The defense was unbelievable all year long. I mean, it was it was never a point in time where we thought we was going to go into a game and a team's offense was going to be better than our defense. So, it was, it was a comfort in knowing that. Here's the play you're talking about, and it's Quinn very alertly. As a redshirt freshman, by the way, Watch Johnny Quinn come in here and scoop that. He he became quite a player that year for a young guy. He stepped right into the fold. He did. He jumped on the he jumped on the scene, and uh, you know his confidence. You know he, he took the red shirt year and he came back this year as a as a red shirt freshman. His confidence was never in question. Um, he stepped in and he made the plays when it was time to make plays, and we had an absolute blast. You know, uh, having him help out that receiving core that that had guys really step up every game. It was a different guy. It seemed like in the receiving core. And so it was, it was fun. So you're banged up uh, after this game. And had you ever had an injury as serious as this thigh injury? I mean, was this one of the first times you've been sidelined like that? I'd never missed a game in my entire career of playing football. We're talking third grade all the way up till uh, this junior year. And I'd never missed a game. So it hurt, you know, it was, it was a situation to where I'd never seen a thigh bruise get so bad that, I'd have to have surgery on it. And so they drained it and I ended up missing a couple weeks. Uh, and really two games that I really had circled on the schedule that I really wanted to play in was the Air Force Arkansas game. So uh, it stinks that it didn't happen. I uh, wish I could have played in it, but the guys, uh, you know, Kevin Moore and, and, and Roy Bishop stepped up in a huge way in both these games and played their tail off. And, you know, Andy Blunt was another big time threat in a receiving game. So it was, it was fun. Yeah, Andy Blunt was a really good pass catching tight end, and he scores in this game. Um, Scott Hall is kind of getting back in the groove, but it was a slow start. I remember that game well because it was really there for the taking, and I felt like if we had had number 43 in there, that would have made a big difference. Because we'll see later on how much when you're in the game, the play action opens up for Scott Hall. But uh, you lose at Air Force in a game that maybe you had a chance, and then Playing uh, Arkansas anywhere is tough. Uh, great memories in the Seth Luttrell era of pulling one off down there. But this game was in Little Rock, and it's a madhouse. If you've never gone to an Arkansas game in Little Rock, I mean, that's their one Super Bowl of the year for the uh, the Razorback fans. I know you didn't play in it, but what, what yeah. do you remember of that? Oh, man, it was loud. It was it was a crazy game. You know, it was uh, – I mean, it was a crazy, crazy crowd. I mean, they were, they were super amped. They, they got great fans. Um, it was great atmosphere to play in. Um, you know, it, it was good, great atmosphere. And we, we were able in 2003, we were to the point where we could really soak up good atmospheres and not be intimidated by them. You know, we had played Oklahoma twice, Texas twice, Alabama. I mean, we played in these big places. So it wasn't like we were past the show. We could really appreciate uh, going to these places and performing and playing. Yeah, there's no doubt. Back then, it was a gauntlet. But uh, you get through the first part of non-conference. You've got one more non-conference game a little bit later against Troy State. But the Monsters are behind you. And typically, 1-3, and three, a lot of times it'd be 0-4, and four, sometimes 0-5. and five. The, the, the signature thing about a Daryl Dickey team back in the Sun Belt was 
we reload and get ready for league. And you had already won 11 straight in league heading into this opener against ULL. Do you remember the team talking a lot about the streak or was it still too young to, to have become a big thing yet? No, nah, it was, you know what? It was, it wasn't a big thing yet. We, we didn't talk about it. Uh, we knew that uh, when league play came, that's when, that's when things happen. And uh, we tried to go out and get as many wins as we could in non-conference to go compete. And then when league play got around, we knew that, uh, you know, we was going to take what we learned in the first, you know, non-conference games and, and, and a, the, you know, we, we took those first four games as preseason games as you should and, and we worked on getting better every week regardless of the score we, we worked on getting better every week and uh we knew we had to be at the best when we got to play and that's and, you know that's kind of how we did it the, the first series. so scott hall was a really good leader he's in the hall of fame one of seven players off this team but he was trying to play his way back into the starting role because andrew smith had helped lead the team to a bowl win the year before you open league play and it's going to be, it's going to be Scott. And I think the reason he got the keys was just that experience and that maturity. You see him open up the game here with a big strike to, to Johnny Quinn. Scott's numbers are not just incredible, but he made throws like that to receivers like Quinn. I mean, when it was time to make a big throw, he could certainly do it. Absolutely. He had a great grasp of the offense. He understood it. Uh, he was a smart player. He didn't make mistakes. And that's really what we needed. A guy that didn't make mistakes. You know, he, he, he had the arm. He had the, the the mental ability to make plays when you need him to make plays. Uh, but he could get us in the right play. We we checked a lot. He the right play a lot, and uh, he didn't turn it over because we knew if, if if we had three bad downs, we could punt it. Our defense would get us the ball back. And so we were smart enough to know that. Hey, listen, win the game. You know, we just you know our offense didn't need the game. We just had to not lose it for our defense. And so. That's how we took every approach. We ran the ball well. Um, we threw it when we needed to, and and our D up and and didn't let people score a whole lot. So it was pretty fun. Also pretty fun having you back. You were able to uh, come off the injury and open league play, and yeah, pretty nice night uh, jumping back into the fray. Uh, some big runs. You, know, I couldn't wait. Um, it was very exciting to get back in there and and, and play and. I had a good night, you know. It was it was good to feel uh, to get back and run around and and uh, be explosive and uh, and that's what happened. We we attacked that day and really Lafayette didn't know what they were about to that day. No, and and this is one of my uh, favorite little trivia's of uh, of that era. You know, at Fouts Field, some weird things happened. Three safeties that night. You don't see multiple safeties let alone three in a football game very often but we got three that night yeah yeah you know two came from our defense one came from our special teams unit and then uh, uh you know three interceptions i mean that was just something our defense did i mean they came in and they, they scored points all the time and that's what people don't understand i don't really know how many points they scored but they scored a lot of points for us they put us in situations to where we scored points but our field was super short so uh that defense gets i mean a lot of good we were in 2003 for sure that particular uh, defense was 21st in the nation in total defense and when given who we had played that's really impressive and uh, I believe they were just a little over 100 yards a game allowed in terms of rushing 104 yards per game and again we played some we played some teams with good running backs I mean it, it was a it was a legitimate top 25 defense uh, now you're getting ready to go on the road to a really weird place, but it's a place where you always kind of shined. And that was that long trip to Moscow, Idaho and the Kibbe Dome. Let's, what do you, what do you remember most about the Kibbe Dome? Man, it was, uh, <laughs> it was like a, it was like an oversized basketball gym is what it really felt like. It was, you know, it was a, it was a weird feel. It was an airplane hangar or whatever it was. I remember the turf was super hard. I mean, it was hard at Fouts, but it was really hard in the Kibbe Dome. Uh, that place could get loud, though, just like a basketball gym. They could, uh, if they brought fans in there, you know, it'd echo off the roof and and it would get loud with that playing in the Kibbe Dome up there in northern Iowa, or Idaho. But uh, it was fun. You know, I've had two good, two really good memories from there. Uh, as a freshman, I came in and, and had a game and yeah well in this one you have 249 yards so I, i'm sure they're glad that you don't come back up to moscow anytime soon but 
Uh, you owned the Kibby Dome. It was a <laughs> long trip. That was a league game that took, it just seemed like it took a day and a half to get up there and back. But, you know, you keep it rolling in this game. You saw the defense early. You've now established that you're healthy. Were you 100% coming out of this game? I was. You know, I, I, I felt like uh, the Lafayette game, uh, you know, I was probably 99. And I felt good. Once the adrenaline got going, I didn't feel anything. But that, that Idaho game is really where I felt like, all right, I was back. Um, my body was good. I wasn't worried about anything anymore. And so uh, it was exciting and fun to get back out there. Next up, Utah State. And you keep it rolling. You have another 200-yard game. Um, but this is really where I think Scott Hall starts to take full advantage of the play action. Teams are going to load it up. They're worried about you. They're going to do whatever they can to, to make sure you're not going to beat them. That opens up the passing game. And, and there were a lot of weapons, like you mentioned, um, that Hall could utilize. It, it wasn't just one or two guys. I got you. Uh, yeah, no, we had a, uh, it was a it was a fun game, you know. Idaho was it was it was, uh, it was exciting. Uh, had a big game, but yeah, the play action ended up working here a lot. Uh, I, Utah State was a good football team, and uh, we hadn't played them before, so we really didn't know what to expect. But yeah, we we ran a lot of play action passes right there, and and uh, Claiborne I think caught three touchdown passes in this game, you know, coming off play action. So he was wide open in the flats, and it was a fun game. You know, you look back on that year and so many guys had blow up games. I mean, you just mentioned Claiborne. We've seen uh, some other guys that stepped up. It was almost like Coach Dickey and his offense would always find a guy that maybe the other team wasn't expecting. Roy Bishop with three touchdowns. And we move now to Middle Tennessee, which is a tough, tough matchup back in the day. And this was the Joel in the Wigway show. I mean, he went nuts in this game. So it, it seemed like you were the consistent guy, but there was always somebody else to make a noise. Absolutely. There was a great, it was a, it was a great cast of, of, uh, of individuals, you know, that played in a team atmosphere. Nobody went into the room that was complaining about the ball. Uh, the year before last, Jamel Branch had an unbelievable year and, he's, and he still, still did. But then, you know, Johnny Quinn steps up and Joel steps up, Blunt steps up and, you know, then Claiborne steps up. I mean, every game we have a new guy stepping up and making plays uh, on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, that that was what it, we went into every game trying to win it. It wasn't about we need to get this guy a certain amount of touches. It wasn't if we needed it. We really ran into games just trying to win. And that was that was our focus point. Yeah, and there was something special about the Blue Raider matchup because we had uh, dethroned them as champions back in 2001. And they, they were – anxious to try to do the same thing to us this was a 33 28 game this is where the streak was was getting a little bit tight but you pull it out and now you step out of uh, conference play late in the season pretty uh, random that that would happen but troy state now known as troy was coming into the league the next year and so they were scheduled by everybody to kind of get them ready for sunbelt play little trivia question when's the last time the mean green defense pitched a shutout uh, I believe it was against Troy in 2003. <laughs> there have been some close calls, Pat, but there hasn't yeah. been a shutout since this game. And this is where the defense just said, yeah, you know what, Troy State, you're not quite ready for us. Yeah, it was it was, it was was a fun game. You know, our defense stepped up and played really well. Troy had a very, very good defense as well, you know, anchored by none other than DeMarcus Ware on the other side at defensive end. And the other defensive end was OCU Manure, I believe, that played for the Giants. I mean, they – they had two guys that were very, very good NFL players and very, very good college players. And, uh, you know, it was a defensive battle. Um, and we ended up scoring three, or, you know, 21 points and they didn't score any, but it was a, it was a hard fought game. I mean, there was no easy, easy yard gain. Um, it, we had to scratch and claw to win that one, but it was a fun game to play. It's never easy to pitch a shutout, but it's harder now because of the explosive offenses. And so uh, you, you're, going back quite a ways to, to see uh, holding the team scoreless. But that was a nice night at Fouts that kept uh, the momentum going. And now you jump into another tight battle. This is against Louisiana Monroe, um, I believe still known as the Indians back then. Um, but that was always a tough matchup, taking on Monroe. Monroe every year was hard. I mean, they you know, for whatever reason, they stepped up and played us like – you know, it was their Super Bowl or whatever. You know, they they we lost to them in 01. Is it was our, you know, we lost our very first conference game in 01, and it was to them, those guys. And then 
Uh, we turned around and beat them in 02. And then this 03 year, I mean, they were good. They were tough. Uh, they had a safety named Chris Harris that played a long time in the NFL. He was a really good football player. Um, Monroe was ready to play. And, and we had to step up and we had to play good football. And, and this game came down to our defense making a play at the end of the game, breaking up a pass. I, th I believe it was Taylor Casey or Chris Hurd or somebody and, uh, and breaking up a pass so we could win that football game. It would be your uh, eighth game to eclipse 100 yards. You grabbed your 13th rushing touchdown, but more importantly, you show us what it really looks like to uh, be a quarterback here. Here's Cobbs to Randy Gardner for a touchdown. I mean, this is this is Aikman to Irvin right here. Man, I think I really missed my calling. I, I think I probably should have been a, a quarterback. You know, I mean, you, you look at that form, you look, you know, across the body to the middle of the field. I mean, who teaches that? I mean, that's unbelievable. <laughs> and it might have been the only uh, catch of the year for Gardner. I mean, he was an excellent blocking tight end, but he wasn't known for hauling in a lot of catches. That was that was blunt. So this one went way against the grain. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, he, he caught – he was a great player, very selfless, selfless, selfless player. I mean, that, that was our whole team. They were very selfless. And and uh, Randy's a great friend and, and still comes to all the games. And i um, glad that uh, – He's on there and made a big play. Oh, yeah. He'll like that. He'll see this. And his first call will be out to Bandera to catch up with Andy Blunt. Um, <laughs> yeah. Arkansas State. Here comes Arkansas State. And this is a uh, title clincher. Um, yeah. I remember this Coach Dickey saying before this game that he'd never seen your particular group as focused. Do you remember that being a week where focus was at a higher level? Oh, I remember this week real, real well. Uh, I That week, you know – it was early on, you know, we, we heard rumbling about Arkansas state saying we wasn't very good. We were way overrated. Uh, they were going to come in our house and, and beat us. And, you know, cause we'd had, we'd had a couple close games and, and we'd edged them out. We found a way to win. And now this team rolls and, and they say that, you know, they were having a, I think a pretty good uh, gear up to that point. Or, uh, and so they sparked, they sparked the fire that they really didn't want to compete with. And uh, Coach Dickey got us fired up about it. And uh, we showed up and showed them who were the king of uh, or Sunbelt Conference for sure. That's one of my favorite runs of yours. It didn't go for a touchdown, but it was the, the kind of run that from the press box level, you would disappear and then just come out the other side. And, and you did that a lot. Not that you were small, but you were able to really kind of scrunch up and just hit a small hole. Um, sometimes your height can be an advantage and there you are trying to influence the Heisman voters. Yeah, it was, it was a fun game. And you know, that, that Heisman deal right there kind of came with, uh, with coach Dickey, you know, though, you know, all week long, we started saying, you know, if we're beat, if we're beating them by this bag, can we do this? Can we do that? And, you know, uh, just because we were just so, we were so focused and so mad that, that somebody would say that, that, you know, that, that they could beat us and it, it amped us up and we did some things right there that that we probably shouldn't have did you know I posed for the Heisman and you know uh Jeremy Pearl coming up here in a second is going to do something really crazy as well <laughs> it's um it's one of my favorite moments in the radio booth the Jeremy Pearl I, I we call it the grenade what did you guys call it well that's what it was it was the grenade I, it was on a movie and I can't remember what it was uh <laughs> I don't remember at the time, but, you know, it was one of those deals. We were going to throw it up and it was going to hit the ground and everybody was going to get, explode. It was, it was pretty funny, man. It was, it was classic. You know, we had, you know, I think uh, Cody Spencer makes a sack in the game and runs around like a gorilla for a little bit. I mean, we just, we had fun. That game was really, really fun. Uh, we played together. We came, came together as a team. And I don't think Arkansas State ever said that to, to the papers about us again after that. Yeah, this, this went down in Mean Green Radio Network lore as the gorilla and grenade game. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it ties up another trip to New Orleans, and yet you still got one more uh, regular season game left. So the streak is now on the line. A chance to get to nine wins is on the line. And you're getting an ESPN um, nationally televised game against the Aggies at New Mexico State. So as I remember it, there really was no drop off in intensity. This, this one mattered just as much because you were rolling. Yeah, we were. And, and this is where the streak kind of came into hand. You know, we, we already won the conference, I think, basically at this time. And, uh, but we wanted that streak to stay alive. We didn't want to lose to anybody in the Sunbelt Conference. And so uh, 
we stepped up and we came and we came to play and New Mexico State's a, a really good team and and it kind of turned into a little bit of a rivalry with us and uh so we stepped up and uh we had to battle our tails off to win this game and came came down to a field goal from Nick Bazadua and happy that guy was on our team well, it came down to you picking up a third down and eight and a fourth down and one to give Basil do a chance. But yeah, yeah that, that was that was back in the day when you'd run the ball on third and eight. We don't nobody does that anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I remember getting on the the plane that night and Coach Dickey grabbed the uh, microphone and just started chanting Basil do. Uh, yeah, yeah, and- I absolutely remember that. And I asked Coach Dickey too. You know, I said third and eight, man. You're running the ball. He goes, well, if we didn't get it on third and eight, we were going to run it again on fourth down. So it didn't matter. So it was it was fun. It was a good deal. Here's Nick the kick. He was very very reliable. We've had a lot of good kickers in my time here, but this guy was steady Eddie, and he wins a game as the uh, as the clock expires on national TV. That's a pretty big moment heading into a bowl game. It was, you know, it was fun. Uh, but we, I mean, we wanted to win that game. We were happy we won it. Uh, and we wanted to get focused on the uh, New Orleans Bowl. Fans today, a lot of them will remember because a lot of them were there. But some of the newer age fans don't realize it had become a scene every year. I mean, it was it was a rite of passage. When you won the Sun Belt, you automatically went to the New Orleans Bowl. So it was one of the early bowls of the year. Uh, it was at a great time before Christmas in New Orleans. And literally, Mean Green fans could kind of own the French Quarter. It really didn't get old. We did it four years in a row. But this year, um, you know, it was another chance to beat, at the time, a Conference USA team. Do you remember thoughts about preparing for Memphis and then finding out that uh, D'Angelo Williams, their top guy, was not going to play? Yeah, it, it, it was a talk all year long. You know, uh, D'Angelo Williams was a great running back. He had a great NFL career, played with uh, the Panthers for a long time. But uh, I remember going in that game, They were the, the whole matchup was D'Angelo Williams and Patrick Cobbs. And I was thinking, well, no, it's D'Angelo Williams versus a very great defense. And it's Patrick Cobbs playing against Memphis defense. And so uh, I didn't get tied up to the matchup. Uh, he was a great running back, watched him play all year long. Sad that he didn't get to play in the game. But uh, it was fun. You know, it, it was a fun game. We missed a lot of opportunities to win that game, uh, myself included. Just, I mean, I, we just didn't play up to the, the standard that we were used to playing to. And uh, credit to Memphis for uh, taking advantage of that and winning. Yeah, Memphis, uh, as I recall, hadn't been to a bowl game in like 30 years. So this was a really big deal to them. Not that it wasn't to North Texas, but uh, not as sharp in that bowl game as as, uh, North Texas was the previous year against Cincinnati, although I think Memphis was a better team than Cincinnati. And yet it didn't it didn't really take a lot of luster off what was a great year. You have 110 yards in this game. You scored twice. Had the Mean Green won, you you could have easily been the MVP. but any regrets thinking back to that game? Any, I mean, do you do you wake up at night and say we had a chance, should have pulled that one out? Yeah, early in the game, I I had a I had a run that uh, I kind of broke loose and I tripped and fell, and uh, that one haunted me for a long time. But you know, I mean, who knows what would have had? We had fun. We played. We played decent. We didn't play to our standard, and uh, which was good. I mean, it is. We, we expected to win. But, uh, you know, it fired us for next year, knowing that we didn't finish out on top and, and uh, just rolled over to the next season. We've taken a look back at the 2002 uh, New Orleans Bowl team with George Dunham. And now we've done this on 2003 with you, Pat, and, and you were a part of both teams. With all the uh, arguments going on right now uh, about best team in, in North Texas history, I wouldn't ask you to tell me who that is. But who do you think was better between 2002 and 2003? So much overlap of talent, but which uh, which season was really the best? I, I mean, it's hard it's hard to explain. I mean, I I would have to go with 2003 just because those those guys were in a in a bigger prime on the defense side of the ball. I mean, you take Brandon Kennedy's now a senior, and uh, Adrian Owasom is now a a big time junior making a big time presence, Michael Pruitt on the line. And then you have three linebackers who are all seniors and Taylor Casey, Chris Hurd, um, Cody Spencer. I mean, unbelievable group of guys. And then you turn around and you have uh, Jonas Buckles and Marquise Knowlton and Craig Jones in the backfield with with good corners. The defense was just unbelievable. And an old line that was, that was primed and ready in 03 that were really, really good and, and playing with a lot of confidence and, uh, 
you know, you have two quarterbacks that are really good. One won a bowl game, and now he's a backup and a starter who's who's done unbelievable things. I, I just think that the quality of depth um, that ended up happening in 2003 kind of made them a better team. But it was the same group of players. If you looked all the way across the board uh, with the guys, you could you could almost say the same thing in 2003. You had Kevin Galbraith at running back and me as a backup. And so, I mean, the depth kind of goes back and forth. But um, I, I, that 2003 team was just fun to play for. I mean, we didn't – not only did we – in 2002, we went into games with confidence. But in 2003, we went into games with – uh, unbelievable confidence knowing that we're going to go in and we're going to be the best team on the field. So if we do any retro stuff, are you in favor of bringing back that script North Texas? This is my jacket from the 2003 bowl game, by the way. I am that helmet behind you right there. That, that would be, uh, I like that helmet. I, I like the, uh, the little curse of North Texas. I mean, that's, it's kind of partial to me. So I, I like yeah. it. You had script on your head and you had block on your chest. We had North Texas, North Texas. You yeah. knew who we were. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. My other memory from, from all of that is this was the shirt you got at the beginning of the year. It's not quite as nice as the one I got on right here. Yeah. And one of the players asked Coach Dickey, why can't we get better shirts? Remember his response to that? Should have played better in high school. Should have played better in high school. Unbelievable. I mean, that's 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 the kind of guy Coach Dickey was, man. If you wanted, <laughs> if you wanted better, you should have played better in high school. It was unbelievable. He's a he's an awesome dude. Yeah, I remember when I got to North Texas, they had those those same shirts right there, big block letters. They even had the shimmies, the one that the, the little cutoff shirts they'd hand out. It was it was crazy. The sleeves were longer than the shirt. Yeah, so it, it was funny. Our gear is a little bit better these days, but oh. I still, I still have all that old stuff. Way hey, better. Before, before we let you go, uh, just talk a little bit about the guys. You you've got a stable of running backs coming back whenever we do get back. Uh, I mean, when you're looking at at Siggers and Tory and and even Nick Smith. Um, how often are you talking to these guys? I know there's only so much you can do right now, but it seems like this coaching staff's doing everything they can to be communicative and keep everybody on board during this pandemic. We are. We're talking uh, a group of guys. Uh, you know, those guys you mentioned right there are, are great, and um, it's good having a good older veteran group of guys like that. Trey's doing an unbelievable job of, of, of communicating and talking and uh, our young guys are doing good, Oscar and a couple couple other guys. So uh, the running back unit, I'm excited about. Uh, I expect a lot of great things from them. And uh, we expect our unit to be super competitive as a group. We want to get better competing as a group together. And then uh, hopefully that carries on to the field and, and we can have an unbelievable year. You know, we're, 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 we're fighting for a, a championship and – um, our guys sense that and they're hungry for it. And so uh, I'm excited to, to get out of this quarantine and get back to work. Yeah, uh, no spring ball. It's weird, especially when you're bringing in some new coaches, because to me, spring ball always meant a lot to uh, to a coaching staff when you had any kind of changes. And obviously, Seth is, has done a great job of, of replacing good coaches. But uh, I know that that's a frustration for everybody. And and yet everyone seems to be in pretty good spirits and everyone's healthy. That's that's the number one thing. Uh, we haven't heard anything. Uh, bad yet so hopefully we can keep it that way you've got a great young family I know it's been hard probably uh, juggling all of that but uh, at least you're getting some more family time than you probably aren't uh, used to oh no it's it's fantastic being at home you know being around my kids hanging out you know and and everybody being at home and being able to you know be locked in with them full time our kids are loving it my wife's loving it a little too much I think so uh, <laughs> but it's good you know, it's all kind of honey dude He's drawing up stuff for me to do now at this point, but it's, you know, it's, it's a weird time right now is a weird time, but uh, it's different. And so you just got to live in the moment and take advantage of it. And uh, going back to our running backs, you know, you're talking about ball uh, spring brawls where Tr Trey Siggers really busted on the scene last year. And so, um, you know, who, who knows what, who would have been the guy that busted on the scene this year. So hopefully, you know, we can we can figure those things out whenever this thing does get cranked up and uh, can roll from there. Well, you've always been a loyal, mean greener, even when you were uh, doing other things. But now we've got you back on staff, which is awesome. You're the past president of our North Texas Letter Winners Association. I want to encourage everybody, especially those uh, those former players, to get their memberships updated, because right now the ballot is out there for the Hall of Fame. You've been a part of that process. Um I just think it, uh, it's important that right now, while we have some extra time on our hands for all the letter winners to, to get involved in that. 
Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the, we, we got an unbelievable group of, uh, of letter winners. Uh, we just got to do a better job of tying back in together. And so it's going to take us individually to, to reach out to guys and, and try to get them back uh, around people. Um, just be a part of this thing. You know, we knew how it was as a player uh, with the fans and the former alumni. So let's be better every year. Let's be better than the group in front of us. So let's, let's, uh, let's see if we can't rally the troops and, and get all these guys back. Pat, make sure you stay hydrated. If you need any kind of koozies, I've got about 43 of these. Oh, nice. I like it. I like it. Uh, listen, I appreciate your time. Look forward to getting uh, back together in person sometime soon, but great memories. And oh, fantastic. Awesome to relive with you. Oh, it was good, man. 2003 was a great year. Uh, I wish I could go back, man. College was a fun time. I'd go back to 01 and do it all over again if I could, but uh, good time, man. I had, a, I had a blast reliving the past and I appreciate you, Hank. And uh, let's go, let's go make another champion out of this team. That's Patrick Cobbs. He led the nation in rushing in 2003 and uh, would share the backfield a couple years later with Jamario Thomas, the only tandem in NCAA history to be back-to-back -back rushing champions in the same backfield. Great memories, and he's still a big, big part of our program, so great having him on board. Also want to thank Zach Powell, who puts all this together and makes it look like maybe I had something to do with it. But good to be back on the back porch. Don't know what we'll do next, but stay tuned. Hopefully you'll enjoy this one. We enjoyed making it for you. So thanks for being with us and go mean green.